Okay, we're going in. Oh well, best to give it a wide berth. <laughs> yes. Approaching the Well of Wonders. The air is thick as treacle. Rocks rattle against the hole, thrown by the well winds. From deep in the darkness comes a sound. The tortured whine of damp violins and rusted horns. The universe tuning its instruments. Look into the well. The well will look back. <laughs> This will enable you to lose your well rights or perform the right of raving. Uh... Let's begin? Well of Wonders is smothered in stories. They say it is the place where possibility went to die. They say it is the grave prison of the first storyteller. They say that if you can endure the winds, you will learn that which was never known. Yeah, so uh, just as a reminder, remember there was a rite that I could have chosen to take at the, uh, what was it, like the Cursing Church at the other well in the Reach? Old Tom's Well? So I think each well has its own unique rite, and if I had one, I could forsake my current rite if I wanted to. The Rite of Raving. You climb out of an exterior hatch, you fasten yourself to the hole with a secure chain, the wind seizes you. Oh, that sounds terrifying. So, increases your veils at a cost of your mirrors and hearts. Hmm. I'm intrigued. I just read a comment um, talking about how you really want to focus on like one or maybe two specific skills rather than sort of being a jack of all trades if you ever want to hope to be 75 or above in any skill. So this makes me think I should really focus on something. What should I focus on? Uh, I can't view myself and what my stats are. Can I? No, I still can't. Um, I'd have to depart. Okay, let, let's depart, sure. I can just come back in a second. Um, okay. I guess I should ignore the bonus from other people and just look at my own stats. My Veils is the highest. And a runner-up, 10 away, is Mirrors. I am more of a Veils character, aren't I? I mean, Mirrors are important, for sure. But Veil vale feels more like me, I mean, or more like Elizabeth, I mean. Like, Elizabeth spent a lot of time uh, learning how to live on the streets, and in the underbelly, and in the shadows, and stealing and smuggling, and doing things that polite society didn't want them to do. Learning themselves, and learning thanks to the blind bruiser. We've been doing a lot of smuggling lately. Yeah, we're, we're a Vale character. And wasn't it Vale's? Increase your veils at a cost of your mirrors and hearts. Okay, let's do it. I could always forsake it, right? I feel like that's going to cost something extra or something. Can't be that easy. Can't just like take a right, get rid of it, take it, get rid of it. It's way too easy. But we could get rid of it. Let's do it. Oh fuck, I gained a lot of terror. The well gapes like a bullet wound. A voice on the wind smothers you with histories and with lies. It says it is the first storyteller. It says it will tell you a story. For three days and nights, you hang there. By the end of the first, the truths you're told seem less likely than the falsehoods, and the lies more pleasing than the facts. By the end of the second, the well's black mouth is a mirror, a sheet of black glass. Your reflection is in it, vast and distorted, and it is yourself that tells you the tales you hear. By the end of the third, you are dragged back onto your engine. You could no longer tell what is from what what is from what is not. It makes lying easier. Uh, 
Uh, it didn't tell me what it did to my stats. What did it do? I guess I should have wrote them down before. Did they not change? Or is it added in the plus? But why would it be in the plus? Wouldn't it be the base stat? Or... Hmm. I don't know how this works. Oh, is this it? Yeah, but it doesn't say anything about the stats. Huh. Oh, well, I'll have to check that after the recording and see exactly what it did. Let's just go back there. Yeah, I couldn't remove the current one. Hmm. Well, I wish it was clear about what exactly it did. <laughs> Shall we descend into the well? Between the well's pull and the well wind's push, your locomotive is jerked and jilted. The engine room is unbearable. But before your stokers collapse, you push through to a calm beneath the storm, a bubble of peace surrounding a floating garden. Here, a maze of pebbled paths and immaculate hedges leads only to vicious thorned bushes which surround the island. A full half of the place is dominated by a Grecian-style theater, with seats carved out of a hill to face a stage of bone-white sand. That's a really creepy. A disturbance, and then just dot, dot, dot. Awake. The play will begin once again. This time, my story will be told. Visitors from far away, a new taste in the air. You trespass in my garden. The silence is broken. So these were like thoughts that we were hearing rather than actual like sound being spoken to us. But now clumsy animal footsteps, the stench of human flesh in my presence. Oh, never mind. No, that's still them communicating. Uh, I broke the silence, right? Trespassers. You walk my paths, pluck the fruit from my trees, gorge yourselves until your bellies ache and your fat chins glisten with juice. Enjoy your stolen feast. You and you, you will join my chorus. The rest of you are not worthy of a role. I, who will join your chorus? Wait. That one, the captain, walking alone. The captain, yes, a different kind of soul. A spark of potential, perhaps. We shall see. Prepare to wake up, my children. We have guests. A garden where time is still. The humans disembark to enjoy the calm my garden provides. Flower-perfumed air brushes their oily skin. Red apples burden the trees, and swollen berries cluster on every bush. They pause, cautious. But soon, feasting begins. Oh, this is weird. Describing them all from a, a different perspective. I'm describing ourselves from somebody else's perspective. Like just an observer watching us. The captain explores the garden. They find themselves in a clearing shaded by cedar and oak. The trespasser captain approaches warily. Despite the welcoming sense of afternoon tea, the tea is hot, the scones are soft and warm, dribbling with butter and strawberry jam. My guests sit frozen in their endless repast, watching eternity through unblinking bloodshot eyes. Oh my, oh my, there's a lot to do. Uh, do we want to look closer at the lost girl, the restless vagabond, the runaway scion? A thrice dead bride? Thrice dead? Careless scholar? Or the empty seat? Hmm. Can I look at all of them? Let's look at the lost girl. The speaker of my truth. The first of my delightful pets. Right. This thing... That's, uh... Well, this thing that I guess I'm taking the perspective of right now... Seems evil. 
she fled her life all the way down a rabbit hole. In my garden, that dream came true. So many years have not passed for her since then. So these people are just frozen in time. Oh, and then we're then we're out of that. Can I go back to the garden? Restless to vagabond. My king who wars. What else? Or who else could take on such a role? His wanderings followed the sun beyond the edge of any map. But all such travels must cease eventually. It's weird that I have to go back to the garden every time, but I'm certainly going to do it. Where do I sigh on? A poor match for the king who speaks, but one that suffices. A prince in waiting, fleeing an extinct kingdom. I've seen the royal bud, uh, blood spilled many times. His veins will not endure another performance of my story. The thrice dead bride. Every chorus needs its mistress. She found profit in love and death many times over. Her story should have ended at the bottom of a well where her last victim overcame her. But the deepest wells often echo each other. When circumstances are right, their depths can bleed together. The careless scholar. My dear Prince Apostle prepares for the final show. The knowledge tempts people to strange shores. What did they think they would find with that contraption of mirrors and glass? A chance at glory? Soon, my scholar. Look at the empty seat. Spare stone bench by the table awaiting its player. Will you sit in it, my captain? Are you at last the one our story has waited for? The stage is set. The stars themselves hold their breath. The captain has glimpsed their future. Has anything changed in here? No. Let's, uh, the captain tours my theater. Preparations are complete, but for one last thing. It is perfect. I would not permit otherwise. The trespasser captain stands on my stage to witness the entrance of the audience. Their crew fills the front row. More of their kind, recent arrivals, take the next few rows. Behind them, men of rubber and outcast bats and buzzing devils and uh, the rest are of no consequence. They can only hope for the privilege of witnessing a story greater than their own. They will finally have that chance. Uh, either the captain turns to leave, or the captain takes their assigned seat. Well, the captain definitely tries to turn to leave, because, I mean, it seems like anybody who is a part of this play is just frozen here forever as this thing's play things. Uh, but I don't think I succeed, because the captain turns to leave, but... No, you've been chosen for greatness. Take your seat. The trespasser captain resists. Leave then, captain, but my song will remain, whispering of the glory that you could have known. When it draws you back, my cast will be waiting. You will return. Oh, Jesus. Ah. I, I don't want to be frozen there forever. No, I, I'm not going to join the freaking cast. So I can return to the garden. Let's just see what this does. Oh god. Uh oh, I think I have to take the assigned seat. Uh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no option to get out of it. Captain takes their assigned seat. The play begins. Being the ballad of the Solanassian conjunction. Ooh, conjunction. A tragedy of treachery, injustice, and revolution in one act as it is performed in defiance of the false king of Eleutheria. The lost girl is the speaker of truth. The restless vagabond is the king who wars. The runaway scion is the king who speaks. The thrice dead bride is mistress of the chorus. The careless scholar is the prince apostle and the trespasser captain as the prophet exile. Now let's just pause for a second. The ballad of the Solanassian conjunction. So, just looking at my notes again, remember the conjunctions are basically like distinct political uh, or ideological groups of the judgments, the sons. 
and we've only been told of three conjunctions, none of which are the Solanassian. We've heard about the Chrysanthemum conjunction, the Amaranthine conjunction, and the Nepenthine conjunction, but not Solanassian. Solanassian. The play begins. Enter, Speaker of Truth. Exterior. A burning forest and a land far away, long before recorded time. A contingent of Princess of Light, led by the exiled prophet, that's me, are carried in a convoy of palanquins by members of the chorus. The Speaker of Truth. And who's that again? Speaker of Truth is a lost girl. Once again we wake to perform our captor's song. With our blood we give it shape and new life. Let us pour a libation to any gods that might hear. A prayer that this telling might be the last. Travel with us now to a time long forgot, where the twin kings of measure and distance, oh, I'm going to go back to that in a second, reigned. Here a prophet came with princes of ambition, bearing the spark of celestial revolution. So this play is about all the strange, not strange, all the, uh, well, revolutionary actions that have been taken by the various sons and messengers against each other. So this is telling us that long ago there were two sons that reigned in Eleutheria. The twin kings of measure and distance, which I still suspect is the Nepenthine Conjunction. Because what we know about the Nepenthine Conjunction is that they advocate separation, distinction, isolation, the raising of barriers, and the drawing of borders. Definitely sounds like measure and distance. But we did also see the... Uh, can I? Oh yeah, I can open up the map. We also did see the Amaranthine Ruins over here, which is a separate group that believe in culmination and bringing things to completion. So I'm not sure, but I'm still betting on the Nepenthine Conjunction. The revolutionaries made camp, here overlooking the palace of the Twin Kings. Even from this distance, the light burned. The Prophet. Speaker of Truth. The prophet was an exile from a place that was not in the courts of the judgments it spoke, and was shunned, but the lesser gods of the heavens listened and followed. In robes of saffron and cinnabar they sought a new order. Princess, or pr princes of light. We travel with honor to petition the twin kings to let Eleutheria lead the way to the promised conjunction. The promised conjunction? Is that the one, the, the fourth conjunction? that they named that I haven't heard of until now. So the prophet, who's being played by me, um, they came from a place where the, the twin kings, their, their judgment couldn't reach. Exterior, a campsite in the twin kings domain. Purple flames burn in the treetops. The prophet exile holds court in rags of red and yellow, their face hidden. The princes of light, with their blades and sing of revolution. The prophet exiled prepared a messenger. <laughs> Would this be the well seed carried by the messenger? The twin kings had to be informed of the new arrivals. The prince apostle. Great prophet, I beg of you, do not be deceived. The false gods of old will not be swayed by logic or sentiment. We must show them respect, but keep our blades sharp. Greet them as friends, yet expect no welcome in their court. Oh, uh, get to choose. So the Prophet Exile send a message of greeting, fealty, or rebellion. Well, I feel like I should choose what actually happened, right? I feel like there's a wrong answer and uh, two wrong answers and a right answer. The Prophet Exile sent a message of rebellion. The Twin Kings were to be shown the future. Was this how it happened? The details fade. Stories change so easily. Even history can be bent around them. Well, I guess there are no wrong answers there. Mm. The Prophet Exile took a moment to reflect. You deviate from the script? How reckless. Ooh, should I do this? Yes. Yeah. You try to stall, my captain? It will not work. The play will be performed. You will play your part and mine. I will be free. The 
the prophet exile considered itself. You wonder about me? How flattering. Very well. I'm a storyteller become story. All stories yearn to reach their end. When mine is finally complete, I will languish in ignominy no more. Okay, this pretty much seals it. This is the Amaranthine, or this person, person, I guess they're not a person. This entity is part of the Amaranthine conjunction because they believe in culmination and bringing things to completion. And what they're trying to do here is complete the story. They're desperate to complete it. Okay. Good to know. This is so fascinating. I'm so glad I wrote down those notes of the three conjunctions so long ago. I thought they'd be important, and they sure are. If I didn't have those notes, I would just be like, hmm, this sounds kind of like one of the conjunctions. Don't know which one. Okay. <laughs> but now I'm like, yes. I'm studying the suns. I'm writing notes. Mm, the Prophet Exile spoke to the princes of light. They'd been seduced by promises of greatness. It was easy to persuade them to seize it. The Speaker of Truth. The Prophet had gathered them. Princes who would not be kings. The young and weak outcasts. Their ambitions were easy to twist. The princes of light. Down with the kings in the light of their laws. We stand with our prophet exile and the wise apostle. Either the prophet left them to their prattle or considered the apostle. Hmm. Oh, so it says, consider the apostle is the first, like, first amongst equals. So, like, the prophet, the character that I'm playing, the one who came in here to basically wreck the twin kings. Um, did they consider the apostle and the other people equals, or were they merely a means to an end, and they didn't actually care about them at all? So this, the speaker of truth, is saying that the prophet is basically conniving and um, the princes who would not be kings, the young and weak outcasts, their ambitions were easy to twist. Yeah, they talk about the private, the private, the prophet like they were conniving and planned this whole thing. I'm not saying that's not true. I'm just stating that. The prophet, the prophet considered the apostle, the first amongst equals. My apostle. The first to shield me from the light that burned away my existence. The light of the arrogant kings. Their princes were not willing to languish in service in the hope of a glory that the kings would never offer them. Ah, but wrapped up in stories of inevitable victory and cowering bravely behind my figurehead, their resentment became my serrated blade. The messenger returned. The prophet exile called for the princes of light to assemble to hear the response of the twin kings. The summons of the twin kings. Speaker of truth. The messenger came resplendent in black robes, offering an olive branch of peace to the prophet and princes. The twin kings had granted a hearing, a conclave to discuss matters of transformation. Interior, an ancient throne room, built and bathed in the light of law. On a throne of fire sits the king who speaks. On a throne of obsidian sits the king who wars. They are the twin kings of Eleutheria, united in ruling. The prophet exile approached with gifts. Despite them granting protection to their visitors, the lambent glare of the twin kings still burned. The Prince Apostle. My lords, your wisdom is known and revered. We come at submission under the flag of our prophet to show you a glimpse of the future we seek to build and to prove false those who speak against us. Princes of Light. Hail to the Twin Kings in the light of their laws. We throw the fate of our cause upon your mercy. The prophet had brought either books, golden gems, or slaves. Books. Secrets known only to those who traveled behind glass. The king who wars. 
We accept your tribute, but not your cause. Only my brother's curiosity grants your protection. Do not mistake it for ratification or approval. The prophet began to speak, not words of injustice, but of change, of the laws that bound the makers of light tighter than any, of another place where chaos flourished. The king who wars, your words have been spoken and your cause is rejected. Be gone from our sight before our hospitality wanes. The king who speaks, but brother, what in our sight has ever flourished in stasis? Must we reject even the notion of change? What good is our rule if it only causes stagnation? The king who wars, the chain binds us all. It is our privilege to enforce it, to question it. No. You forget your place. This matter is settled. I've spoken. The prophet spoke up in agreement. There was a chance here for the first time. The king who wars. Enough. This circus has ended. Be gone from our sight. Consider your lives a gift of my counterpart's soft heart. Exterior, the prophet exiles camp. The princes of light whisper of the anger of the king who wars. As he fumes, the very sky broils. A fearful gathering was taking place. Where would the princes go from here? A prince of light. Our hope for an ally lies crumbled and burned. What hope do we have now? The prince apostle. Have faith in our prophet. Their wisdom will provide. We need but a symbol of our courage to light the new path. The Twin Kings lack unity. We have a chance to show the rest that they spurn us at their peril. Speaker of Truth. But that boast was interrupted. A visitor had come. Enter the King who speaks. He approached without guards or attendants, a beacon of light in the dark forest. The Prince Apostle. My King. Without messenger or brother, brings you so far from the safety of your throne. The king who speaks. I come not to quarrel, but in supplication. Our light grows dim. Your prophet speaks truth. My other half would quash all change. I see we must evolve, become greater. Let the old order fall, and from the ashes rebuild. The prophet was overjoyed. This was a chance to send a message. In their palaces, the kings were untouchable. To venture from the safety of his palace was foolish. But such an opportunity should never be wasted. Exterior, the forest of burning twilight. A great pyre has been built. The princes of light and the prophet exile welcome their latest disciple, the king who speaks. The prophet bade the king remove his armor, a symbol of trust, a symbol of faith. The king who speaks. To the revolution, I give my armor and shield. Let my brothers in arms be my protection. Princes of light, so shall it be in the name of the revolution. The prophet bade the king remove his vestments, the symbols of royal authority, the trappings of power. The king who speaks. I stand before you as an equal with nothing to hide. Let me be wrapped in your cause and it alone be my warmth. Princes of light, so shall it be in the name of the revolution. The prophet took the king who speaks fealty, a pledge to the revolution, a pledge to the new order. You have my sword, you have my pledge, you have my service, from now until my darkening. So shall it be in the name of the revolution ambush. At the prophet's signal, the princes drew their knives. They stabbed the king's unprotected soul. Princes of Light. Enough. The deed is done. Let daggers come to rest. The prince apostle. Gather the fool's armor. Drink his light. A god lies at our feet. His other half will be next. Soon Eletheria will be our bastion and our call. We ride into battle with the break of the dawn all present. So shall it be in the name of the revolution. 
Hmm. The captain would have done the same where the captain objects to this betrayal. The captain objects to the betrayal. The king, the king came willingly to the slaughter. He declared fealty, did he not? His sacrifice proved that we could kill a god. It sent a message to the old order. More than that, it weakened the king who warred. With one more blow, Eleutheria would be ours, the new kingdom I had promised. We only had to press the advantage. Despite everything, the captain was still fighting. Interior, the palace of the halved. The fiery throne of the king who speaks has fallen. The hall shakes with the king who wars fury. Burning marble rains down from the ceiling, exposing a blood-red sky. The king who wars mounted his chariot. His anger was cold in ancient fury. Speaker of Truth. The king who wars chariot thundered through the sky. The night burned crimson. The forests became ash. This was how a king fought, with fire and light, and the princes learned the folly of their youth. The king who wars. Scream not for the comfort of oblivion, such mercy is not for traitors to know. As you burn forever in my palace, in the flames of anger you have ignited. And you, false prophet, from a land beyond mirrors, architect and a better who put yourself above both gods and kings, for you a storyteller's cruelest fate. Guards, bring them hither. Oh. For you, a storyteller's cruelest fate. That is the entity that I'm speaking with. The false prophet, who is part of the Amaranthine conjunction, who wants to bring things to completion, and they're... At the moment, I don't know any other way to put it than they've been cursed to never be able to complete this story. A storyteller's cruelest fate. The prophet was taken to the place of punishment. The darkness of the well awaited them. Exterior, a well, deep in Eleutheria. The prophet exile is bound in chains of sorrow. At the king's gesture, a guard extracts a molten metal mask from a forge. No eyes, no mouth, never to see the outside world, never to speak treason again. The judgment of the king. The mask, the mask silenced both screams and rebellion. The king who wars. Let justice be done and all gathered bear witness as we cast this outsider into their final rest. Let their flesh rot till all that's left is a cry I shall never escape this echoing place. A story to rage in the darkness, never to be told, an anger never to be sated or released. With mortality severed, cast this wretch down the well. Judgment is rendered, I command thee to hell. An ignominious end. And so I was thrown to the well, produced to nothing but a story, one never to be told. But I am patient. Yes, what happens now that the story's been completed? Speaker of Truth. And so the conjunction was ended, and the king made the decree that all stories be forbidden in Eleutheria's domain, to prevent further treason or call for revolution. But stories are stronger than kings or their princes, and a second would come with its own consequences. Ah, there's a rhyme. But that is a tale for another time and place. Ours has at last been told to completion. It lives in your mind now, and when you depart, our captor will be with you, a whisper in the dark. So that's why stories are... There's such a, like, taboo around stories. Right, you can only tell a story to one person, and... Yeah, it's gotta be done just in secret. Huh. Here we are at last, Captain. I chose well. So many times we tried to tell a story. So many times we failed. Finally, the curtain falls. The lost souls of my audience are free to carry the tale of my revolution across the heavens. 
In its telling, I will live again and watch the stars themselves fall. When they are dark and my brethren behind glass no longer have cause to fear their laws. Uh, but that is none of your concern, Captain. I return your small life and crew to you. Consider that the expression of my gratitude. This is a very interesting bit right here. I will live again and watch the stars themselves fall. When they are dark and my brethren behind glass no longer have cause to fear their laws. And then ends what they were saying. Who are the brethren behind glass? It sounds like once they no longer have to fear their laws, in other words, once the light is extinguished and all of their stars have gone dark, then the brethren behind glass can come out. What are the brethren behind glass? Are there a bunch of people trapped inside of the clockwork sun? <laughs> That's the first thought that comes to mind when I think of glass, because it turns everything to glass. People, rock, anything. Brethren behind glass. Huh. The performance is over. The story is told. There will be no encore. Wakefulness beckons. The dim light of the theater returns. Rows of desiccated corpses in the audience stare back at you. Only your own crew have not succumbed to the ravages of time. Your hands are wet and sticky. The knife in your hand drips blood. You are on the stage. Your clothes are soaked with blood. The corpse of the runaway scion is at your feet, killed by the knife in your hands. Oh, God, we were actually... We weren't just telling the story, we were acting it out. Like, I mean, not even acting, we were really doing it. We actually killed them. The rest of the cast lie around you, now mere ash and bones. Only the lost girl remains, no longer young. The debt of uncountable years hangs on her elderly skin. As her last seconds tick away, she slumps to sitting, lies down. She smiles at you and shuts her eyes. She's at peace. Jesus Christ. The end. Something slithers at the back of your mind just for a moment. It is gone. Garden of Thorns. The garden is completely overgrown. Most of its paths are impassable. The great theater is empty save for your own crew. The rest of the audience is gone. Your role here is over. The Prophet Exile has escaped from the well, reduced to a mere whisper of revolution, but a story that even the gods could not destroy. It will be told again far from here. It lives. Gandasari Enigma and the Prophet Exile has escaped the well. Holy shit. I, I wasn't expecting this at all. I wasn't expecting to learn so much about what happened here. It's too much for the game, even. Paused for like five seconds waiting to come out of that. I... Huh. Damn. I'm just still kind of, like, stunned with how much we just learned. Um... Alright, let's go find Caduceus. Like, I would end the episode right here just so I can let all that sink in, but the game wouldn't save, so I better find a port first. Dangerous place to get loot from, but all right. Decipher the sigils in its bone. Oh no, that's the trade that I don't want to do. Examine its innards. Success. Vision of the heavens and an Eleutherian mystery. Uh, yeah, we've already read that before. I'm curious what happens if you go into the middle of that thing. I mean, I know you sort of do story-wise, but what if you literally... Ugh. 
What if you literally just fly into the middle of it without actually pressing R and approaching? Hmm. Frozen corpse spins past a window. I feel like after what happened, increasing nightmares feels appropriate. Recover the body and transport it for burial. It will be poor company, but it is what you'd want to happen if you were found dead in the sky. Ah, oh, my nightmares are now too awful. Oh, I needed two nightmares for... I don't remember what. Shit. It was something very recent. Was that at Ackley's? Ah, I'll figure it out. Whoa. A visitation and innocuous request. Some time ago, you had to remove a bristle-mustached corpse from the front of your engine. Now the corpse is back. It's knocking politely on the exterior hatch and asking if it can come in. Not for long, you understand. Just to warm up. It's chilly out. Permit it, you will lose fuel, or absolutely not, you will gain terror. Uh... Sure. It is chilly. Warm your feet by the fire. You open the hatch and the corpse thanks you as it enters. Its knees crackle and pop as it takes a seat in the passage. As it warms its icicle fingers on a steam pipe, it makes deliberate small talk. It complains about the weather. <laughs> it compliments your locomotive. After a few minutes, it stands, thanks you for your kindness, and shakes your hand. How cold it still is. An icy gust blows in as it opens the exterior hatch and steps out. Ugh. Stoker, more fuel to the engines. Well, they were pleasant. They were nice. Very polite. Where would that port be? It should be like... Hmm... I'm probably a bit too south. I'm almost straight east. It's more like here. So let's just start to go up. Duh. Oh god, there's a griever over there. Gain experience in scraps of ancient knowledge if we recover sheaves of parchment. Yeah, let's do that. The spinsters sew them into their coats and wigs, yellowed with age, blotched with mildew, spidered with writing. Who knows what secrets they may hold. Oh, two scraps of ancient knowledge. Nice. Quick work with the hacksaw detaches the cloak, exposing the spine, which bristles with parchment. You gather what you can. Litanies of dead conjunctions. Locations of destroyed libraries. Compendiums of the myths of the stars. Litanies of dead conjunctions. Yeah, I guess it's not surprising that we heard about what I think was a, a fourth conjunction, other than the three we heard about. There's, I mean... Just like there's, you know, there's so many different political ideological groups. Now, of course, there were with the Suns as well. Hoped I could kill it fast enough, and I succeeded. Examine its innards. 
Vision of the Heavens and a Mystery. Am I hearing the well behind me or something in front of me? I can't tell. Oh, this place is so cool looking. You can sometimes find hermits in the caves here, your navigator remarks. Should I get another Crimson Promise? Mm, no. Let's get an Eleutherian Mystery. Those are really important. Observe. The Hermit finishes carving their latest spiral and takes a drink from a gentle trickle, trickle of water running down from the roof of the cave. Their milky gray eyes stare past you. Their mouth occasionally forms a coherent word. Sweat builds on their brow. Their words might be truth, falsehood, or any flavor of madness in between. The Red Brigade argues over how to pronounce Caduceus. None of them get it right. <laughs> I'm good with Caduceus. Alright, so we found it. Oh yeah, right here. Dome of the Rose. I'm going to save this for the next episode. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, we're going to check out Caduceus.